This is a kid who had every reason in the world to give up on himself, to not make anything of himself and just be on some street corner right now selling drugs or be in some prison just wasting his life away. And from this mess, from this personal mess, he, he sort of, you know, like a, like a rose growing out of cement. I mean, somehow he overcame all, all of these hardships and, and made something of himself. My first impression of Devon Bess, training camp, sweltering, humid, hot August day down here in South Florida. And Devon Bess, when everybody else has gone inside, is running curl patterns and end zone patterns with Chad Pennington. 30, 45 minutes after practice. Everything to him is about, I'm gonna be on top. I wanna win this situation. If the ball's coming my way, I gotta get this ball. Nice timing, good throw. He's just a football junkie. I gotta force myself to come out, even, at, even on like slants and posts, in breaks, stuff like that. I find myself getting to the top of my route and just cruising. So I gotta, I gotta stay on that. That all goes back to my high school coach. He would always tell me, you know, if you want something, you better go get it, you know? People's not just gonna come overhand and stuff to you. And I pretty much took that to heart. Remember when you were here for practice and you me off? And I sent you home for practice and you said, no, I don't wanna go home. I go, it's not your choice. Made me come back and do bear crawls up and down the field and gases and all kind of mess. Dealing with a community like Oakland, kids understand toughness. They don't, you know, sometimes you take your kindness for softness. But at the same time, if I'm gonna be hard on someone, you better hug them real quick. And you put your arm around them, and you let them know that you care, not just about them as a player, that's the least of it, but as a human being, and that you, you love watching them grow as a person. And these guys out here, they're always, they're all, all they wanna know is about Devon Bess. Mm -hmm. Everywhere I go, well, coach, Tell it a story about Devon. <laughs> is it true? Is it true? It's true. Coach yeah. always got a story for me. <laughs> always. The true story of Devon Best began on the streets of East Oakland, California. It was trouble everywhere. Right up the street, next door, around the block, everywhere. I mean, always. I'm hearing all type of gunshots and police sirens and just everything, you know, and me and my brother, little kids, but my dad pretty much, you know, ran this area, so we knew we was all right, we were secure. His dad was living a fast life and they experienced a lot of stuff. You know, his uncle got killed in front of him. We had this whole block pretty much cut off and my dad threw a big barbecue picnic and then some guy just pretty much came back out of nowhere, hopped a fence in the back, came by, shot my uncle. We sitting there watching the whole thing and all I can remember is him laying on the ground, like shaking, like gasping for air and stuff. It's definitely a scar, but like on my heart that I always remember. Bess avoided the trouble surrounding him by turning to football. As a senior, he switched from receiver to quarterback, but still earned a scholarship to Oregon State. I had just graduated from high school. I was getting ready to go to college. You know, I was on cloud nine, man. And then July 9, 2003, man, everything changed. My whole life changed, man. That night, Bess received a phone call from some friends looking for a ride. But when he arrived to pick them up, he quickly realized they were up to no good. They had, like, bags and stuff, you know. I knew, you know, what they was up to, obviously, but. And I didn't want no part of it, but I was just trying to be a friend, you know? And um, I let him, we put, we loaded the stuff in the car, we drove off, five minutes later, got pulled over. This is pretty much where my worst nightmare began. I can recall driving down this street right here, and I seen a police officer coming our way. And all I can remember is him hitting a U-turn, getting behind us, putting his sirens on, and pulling us over. And that's when everything started. He pulled us over. He lined us all up against this curb right here, handcuffed and uh, pretty much just sitting there. And it was amazing because I knew that, you know, the guys had bags and stuff, but I didn't care to ask, like, you know, what's in it or what's going on, what happened? So all I can remember is us sitting on the curb and them going in the bags going through everything, pulling it out in front of us. Laptops and 
uh, PlayStations and I remember like like DVDs. When I seen all that, I kind of I kind of knew that it was gonna be you know a bad situation, and I just put my head down. I remember sitting on the curb, just looking at all the cars go by and everybody just driving, stopping and just watching and just it was just the most embarrassing, most scariest moment I ever you know I ever felt in my life. Initially, I was like, why? Why? Why me, of all people? That was my first first time ever coming in contact with the law. First time. The judge actually wanted me to take 100% blame for it all. And because I wasn't, I think that's why she pretty much threw the book at me. It hurt. It really hurt, you know, just to think about all this I worked so hard for to just crumble like that just in a matter of seconds. Just in a matter of seconds. It was a bad circumstances, you know what I mean? For the offense that he did, he did a bad offense. Don't get me wrong, he should have been punished. But normally, first offense, nonviolent, you get time served, maybe ankle monitoring, and that's it. He got 13 months. As the driver, Bess was convicted of possession of stolen goods and began his sentence in the fall of 2003. When I first got arrested, they sent me to juvenile hall. It's like a cell. You know, you got your bed, you got the, the, the uh, concrete walls, that's it. He was 17, but then he turned 18 while he was in juvenile hall. And so from that point, he went from juvenile hall to the big boys. That right there is where I kind of broke down. I was like, I can't believe I'm going through this. Because at one point, I was they had me in a cell 23 hours out of the whole day. And the one hour they let you out, they don't even tell you. They just come and lock your door and and, 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 and let you be. So if you sleep through it, some days I was in my, my cell the whole day. And that's when I think it really hit me. It was like, man, this is real life. So I had a lot of time on my hands to think about what I want to do. I think that's the time when most kids are like, they give up. It's like, okay, it's over for me. When you're in the middle of that tunnel, you don't see the, the light at the end of the tunnel. Being in that tunnel was like... I never seen the light, you know, although I know that Devon wasn't giving up. After three months, Bess was transferred to the Oren Allen Youth Rehabilitation Facility, also known as the Byron Boys Ranch. When I got there, I had 10 more months to go. I sucked it up and said, okay, if this is what it's gonna be, let me just get through it, let's just get through it. But Bess would need some help. So he turned to the one man he thought could provide it. He reached out to me. I wouldn't make a phone call for him. I wouldn't go see him. Um, you know, it got to a point where, uh, you know, he wrote me three letters. I didn't even respond. I read them, threw them away. At first, I was like, all right, you know, I was kind of hurt, you know, like, you know, he can't, you know, really, you know, not showing me the support that I kind of need right now. But then, now that I look back, I see why, you know, and it kind of made me man up even more. The fourth letter, when he finally wrote and said, look, coach, I did it. This is, I know what I did wrong. He finally took ownership to what happened. That next weekend, I was out at the ranch to visit him. He know that I know way better than put myself in that predicament. I think that's what hurt him the most. He wanted me to really, you know, feel that. Because he said what I felt right there is kind of what he felt when this happened. With Coach Beam's support, football became a focus again. So after I get finished doing my laundry work, I will come out here, set up my calls, and just run routes, run uh, laps around the field, you know, pretty much to keep, my, keep, keep myself in shape, keep my cardio up. Bess began playing for the ranch's seven-on-seven -seven flag football team. We go to numerous amount of high schools and pretty much get involved with seven on seven tournaments. You know, we get a pass from the judge for us to go around and, and pretty much play seven on seven with these teams. Meanwhile, Coach Beam was trying to find a spot for Bess when he got out. I talked with one of my ex-players that was was GAing at Hawaii. Out the blue, I get a call, you know, from Coach Beam saying that, you know, Devon's about to get out. He's looking for a place to go. Uh, what you think? And I'm like, so I'm going to go to Coach Jones and tell him I got a kid that's getting ready to get out of jail that can play. And so I said, bring me some film. And uh, he did. He took the tape back to uh, Hawaii 
and um, show Coach Jones. I brought him the tape, and I'm like, he, I'm telling you, Coach, he can play. I know, I, I, I'm showing you this little seven-on-seven seven where it's just like a clip here, a clip there. I'm telling you, the kid can play. He brought the film back, and uh, there was Devon playing quarterback, playing safety, doing everything, and sure enough, he was right. He could play. Next thing you know, um, when I got out, they, they brought me out there on a trip. So he went on his official visit and just stayed and didn't come home for almost a, a year and a half. In three seasons, Bess broke every major receiving record at Hawaii. He decided to leave school early and apply for the NFL draft. I kind of looked at everything in a whole. I had three good productive years at Hawaii. I was healthy, and when I sent my grade to the advisory board, they gave me a second round grade. So I put all three of those together and the fact that I was just ready to take on the next challenge in my life, I was just like, I'm, I'm all in. But for the second time in his life, Devon Bess's future changed in a matter of seconds. I get to the combine, I run a 4.62. I was just devastated. So then the draft roll around, you know, I'm getting all these phone calls from these coaches and stuff, and they're saying, yeah, we, we really like you, we want you, but you know, we just, we don't know yet. You have some prototypes that you look for at the position, and Devon is not one of the prototype players by any stretch of the imagination that way. You know, I mean, you're looking for a little bit bigger, faster receiver. Bess's performance at the Combine also allowed his past to creep back into his present. When you're just another guy, when you're just down there in that pack, then it does affect it. I've been in those rooms, and I've been in those times when they start talking about it and they just take his name off the board. And that's exactly what happened. On draft day, Bess would not hear his name called. It was another hurdle, and that's how I look at it. You know, these hurdles come, and, and I just jump over them and go to the next one, keep going, keep going. Bess signed as a free agent with the Dolphins and was determined not to waste his opportunity. He came in here with a plan. He was patient. He learned the offense, went out there and worked his tail off. Got a hell of a competition brewing right here now. It's like a heavyweight fight and he just kind of bide his time to play. And every opportunity that we gave him, he took advantage of it. In 2008, Bess went from a walk-on to a starter in the playoffs and finished the season with the second most catches by an undrafted rookie in the history of the NFL. To this day, it hadn't even hit me that I'm playing in the National Football League, which is a dream come true since I was little. So it's just, it's just like a big old dream, kind of. Everybody, I think, can look to them if they're a young athlete or even just a young person and say, okay, you got a mistake in you, but you can overcome that as long as you put your head on straight after that and make the most of what you got. And Devon Best is doing that right now. When we look in this community, we lead the nation in murders per capita for young African-American males. And for a guy like Devon to go into the system, and he got to get out of the system, so he made the system work, if you want to call it, but he, the system worked in some ways because he said, I don't want to be back there. Kids can look at him as a role model now. Never, ever give up. Never let anybody tell you you can't make it because it was so many times when I was going through my situation, all these people, oh yeah, he's done. He's just another statistic. He had an opportunity and he blew it up. And I just never gave up. I always saw the light at the end of the tunnel, always.